really good question. And I wish I could answer you, but I can't. And here to turn the question around, how fast is any given animal today? And we don't know. And when you watch a TV show or you look at a book about animals, really we know the actual top speeds of just a handful of animals that we can run under a controlled condition to see how fast they are. Most wild animals, we don't, we're not able to do that. We can't train them. And honest to goodness, this is the way how they track how fast wild animals are going. They get the Range Rover, they're in the Serengeti. How fast are we going? 25. Is the wildebeest going that fast? I don't know about that. 25 miles an hour is how fast the wildebeest is going. So, because we don't know how fast modern animals are, for the most part, it becomes that much more difficult to try to reconstruct how fast an animal who lived in conditions different than us, different levels of oxygen in the environment, uh, that might be different power to the muscles, muscles arranged in fashions different than any living animal, and the same basic patterns but different sizes, too many question marks in there to get a real good number. I'd love to know what it is though. Okay. Next question is from Virginia. She's a student here at the University of Washington. Uh, I've always wondered, with dinosaurs being so big, how would they manage to reproduce without crushing each other? Uh, I guess the answer was very carefully. But obviously they did it. Um, um, some people have suggested maybe some of them went into the water to do it. Maybe, I don't know. But some of them were in really dry environments. So and the ones that make me wonder are some of the spiked bat guys. I, uh, so I got a follow-up question here from Jacob from Port Angeles, Washington. Uh, he was wondering, uh, do you think T-Rex would brood its eggs? Ah, uh, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. We know that some of the, the group that I call Maniraptoriformes, uh, the ostrich dinosaurs, the oviraptors, the raptor dinosaurs, did brood their nests. That we, we have the, the nests and the skeletons to show that. We even have nests of Tyrannosaur-sized oviraptors that brooded their nests. And now we have kind of goodish evidence that Tyrannosaur, even big Tyrannosaurs were fuzzy, and one of the aspects of fuzziness could be for brooding. Um, we don't yet have a tyrannosaur id nest or Tyrannosauroid nest, and I'd love to see what they look like. If you go a little further down the tree, so that is the evolutionary family tree, we start running into meat eaters that don't have a big space in the middle of their nest for the parent to sit down in. And those ones probably didn't brood it directly. They were probably more like alligators and crocodiles and a couple group of primitive birds that sort of cover with vegetation or arrange vegetation around it. But um, for tyrannosaurids themselves, we don't know. It's a really good question. Uh, next question is from Tony from Tukwila. Uh, did tyrannosaurids have rocks or gizzards to help digest food? You know, we have yet to find gizzard stones, or gastrolids is the technical name, in tyrannosaurids. They are known in some other members of the theropoda, the, the, the meat-eating dinosaurs, including some which were meat-eaters. Sometimes people think that gizzard stones are just for plant-eaters, and many plant-eaters do use them, but there's a, a, a meat-eater from, um, from Portugal called Lorinhasaurus, and it had gizzard stones in its belly. Um, so it's not... It's not unthinkable that Tyrannosaurus would have them, but we've, we have a fair number of pretty complete skeletons that were found out in the field, and to my knowledge, no one's ever reported them in there. Marcus from Bellingham wants to know how wide a T-Rex could open his mouth. <laughs> That's about right. Um, nothing, so yeah, we can, we can look at the jaw joint, and they can open it pretty deep. Um, they probably had to, to get around the legs of animals to sort of get a big bite off of them. Uh, question from Rick from Redmond. What major should an undergraduate study if they want to become a paleontologist? Ah, there's sort of two, two big approaches to doing paleontology, because paleontology really is the overlap of two fields. It's, you've got to, you either have to be a biologist who knows a heck of a lot of geology, or a geologist who knows a heck of a lot of biology. And depending upon what university you go to, you might be a place where, like for example, at, at my university, all the vertebrate paleontologists are in the Department of Geology, so that's where you'd want to go. And as when I was an undergraduate, that's what I that's what I did because all the 
I even took human anatomy at Hopkins in the Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences because they didn't teach it in biology because that involved things bigger than a cell. Um, <laughs> at some universities, it's all over the biology department, and that's where all the whole organismal biologists are, and the geologists are just geophysicists and so forth. And at some universities, you've got them in both departments, and that's great, because um, then, you know, who knows, you can be even double major. I don't, then look, check with your advisors to see if that's appropriate. <laughs> Uh, Nina from Seattle has a, seems like a little bit more technical question for you. Okay. Um, is there any evidence supporting uh, Nanotyrannus as either a young Tyrannosaurus or its own species? Right. Yeah, that's a, that, is, that is a big question in the tiny little field of Tyrannosaur studies. Um, so there's a skeleton, uh, let's see, I'll try to back up to the wall doing this. Uh, a skeleton that's called Jane, and another one that's a skull called Nano Tyrannus, um, where there's a question as to whether, there we go, there's Jane, whether this is a distinct, separate type of Tyrannosaur, or whether it is the growth stage, the teenager, of the early teenager of Tyrannosaurus rex. Now, I think the conclusive evidence to reject the idea that it is a juvenile Tyrannosaurus is either the discovery of a juvenile Tyrannosaurus of exactly the same growth stage that has more features of Tyrannosaurus rex than this skeleton does, <coughs> or an adult of this animal which is clearly not Tyrannosaurus rex. But so far, every nanotyrannus found is a juvenile at a stage we do not have, we otherwise don't have juvenile T. rexes. So I think until one of those other things are discovered, the simplest explanation is this is a young T. rex. So now Tyrannus is just a growth stage of Tyrannosaurus. Happy to be wrong, but because that means there's one more Tyrannosaur species. But, um, but we need that evidence in order to say it's a distinct form. Great. Uh, Lena from Seattle wants to know if T. rex had fuzz, would it be wiry or soft? Ooh, that's a good question, and I don't know that we've got really a good way of answering that at the moment. Now, from what we see of these long filaments coming off of them, they're sort of like down, but the problem is no living bird still has that really ancestral proto-bird structure. All living birds are descendants of animals that have as their basic adult plumage a single shaft with branches coming off and branches coming off that, and down is sort of like a degeneration of that, kind of, but not exactly. <laughs> Developmental biology, you gotta love it. Um, so, we don't have anything today that produces, as far as I know, that produces filaments that are exactly like these things we see on Eutyrannus and D-Long and so forth. My expectation would be kind of soft. But, but it's hard to say, we could be wrong. Uh, Deborah from Bellevue wants to know, what are your general thoughts on whether T-Rex was or wasn't warm-blooded? Ooh, yeah. Um, I, think, I think we can reject for a number of lines of evidence the idea that any dinosaur was cold-blooded in the sense of any modern cold-blooded reptile. There's too many attributes of them their rapid, super rapid growth rate. Uh, there, uh, there's some biomechanical evidence that in order to move a body of this size, you have to have a warm-blooded metabolism, given the amount of muscles they have in them and the fact they're way up above the ground and so forth, uh, that they can't, they almost certainly weren't, weren't cold-blooded in the sense of their contemporary uh, lizards and snakes and turtles and so forth. Um, a complicating factor in this whole warm-bloodedness, cold-bloodedness debate is that part of metabolism is what's going on inside your body, and part of what your metabolism is is what you're taking in from the outside. And the outside world was different back then, including the relative amount of CO2, the relative amount of oxygen, that may have affected the relative amount of productivity of plants at the base of the food chain, uh, it may have affected the rates of production of heat in the body. Um, it may have been easier to have been more blooded in the age of dinosaurs than it is now. Um, I would say 
with all that arm waving going on there. The effective end product is they would have been as active as a mammal today. How they got to that activity level is yet another and really complicated question. But I think in terms of the, the way it's expressed, would be rather continuous activity expressed pretty much the way it would look like if you were at the big cat house or the, the big elephant house or whatever at a zoo and not what you would see in the reptile house. Okay, I'm gonna ask uh, two more questions. Okay, so uh, same question from a couple of different people. Christopher from Tacoma and Noah from Seattle. Basically wanna know how long did T-Rex live? How, what was the lifespan of T-Rex? Right, at present, uh, that T-Rex called Sue, the one that's at the, uh, the Field Museum in Chicago, is the one that they've counted the most rings on, and she was between 28 years old and 29 years old when she died. There is another one that's called Scotty that they haven't finished. It, it's a little more obscure. It looks like it may have been in its early 30s when it died, but we don't see them older than that. It looks like dinosaurs lived fast and died young, that they didn't have to have really long life, so they didn't have little really long lifespan, and there's probably a reason for that, and that is, uh, is, is to turn the question around is, is you know, why don't mammals, why, do, why do big mammals live so long? Big mammals, like elephants and rhinos, live so long because it takes them a long time to reproduce offspring, but the gestation period in a big mammal, well, in mammals, it scales against body size, so that uh, a, a a horse takes, what, nine months or so, a rhino a year, an elephant two years, uh, and then Drikothir, the giant rhinos of the middle of the Cenozoic, might have been three years, and you get one baby after that. And that means you need to live a long time in order to have a lot of, enough offspring that you've got another next generation. Dinosaurs are popping out eggs like nobody's business. So, you know, a couple dozen every year. You don't, need to have a, you don't need to have selection for a really, really long lifespan in order to be able to reproduce, so there's no reason to keep hanging around. You know, lots of babies, you're dead. Next generation, lots of babies. So they didn't need to live a long time. Okay, last questions from Alex from Redmond. He wants to know, where's the best place to find a T-Rex? Ah, yeah, best places to find T-Rexes um, would be places like Wyoming and Montana and Colorado and South Dakota. Those four states have produced the vast majority of T-Rex specimens. There have been some that have been found up in the provinces of Alberta and Saskatchewan. There's been some found in Denver. There's limited remains south, southwest of that. But the best place, the place where the vast majority have been found are Montana and Wyoming uh, and South Dakota and, um, and a little bit more in Colorado. I have to respectfully disagree, Tom. Oh, <laughs> I think the best place to find T-Rexes are in museums. <laughs> there we go. They're guaranteed to be there. And with that, I think uh, we should thank Tom again, and hopefully we'll see you all.